Hello everyone, my name is Emily and this is the fourth video in our Reading Buddy Book Club for July where we are reading Race to the Bottom of the Sea by Lindsay Eager. Now I have to warn you guys, I have been sick for a little bit, just allergies, so my voice might sound a little weird today. Where we left off, Fidelia was in quite the predicament. She's been kidnapped by Merrick the Monstrous and she's also trying to figure out what happened to her parents. Now before we start, go ahead and make sure that you have your reading buddy with you and also if you haven't finished your crafts or coloring pages, um, be sure to keep working on those or if you prefer, you can just follow along with me as I read. Chapter 11 As Nikki laughed, a hearty, beefy sound, the sun tucked itself behind the horizon, sending long, mast-shaped shadows across the jewel's deck in black stripes. Don't tell me, he said, over the din of Merrick's hacking. Could it be? Merrick caught his breath and spat at the feet of the other pirate, returning the gesture. Nick, you ogled the bloody spit as if it were a rare, ten-legged octopus. Merrick the monstrous, he marveled, finally undone by his own cave of wonders. It's only a chest cold, Merrick said. You wish it were so, don't you? Nikyu said, but the cough of the red daisies is unmistakable. Nikyu hooted, then lowered his guns from Merrick's jawline. Luca, he directed one of his comrades, bind the pirates, tie the monstrous to the main mast. A brawny man with arms almost as big as Cheap Shot Charlie's immediately grabbed a rope, but Bloody L dashed forward, scooped up her pistol, and shot at Nikyu, narrowly missing his head. One of Nikyu's men backhanded her with his revolver, sending the jewel's quartermaster tumbling to the floorboards, her hair splaying like white lightning against the darkening sky. Cheap Shot Charlie bellowed and punched at two of the other pirates, who grabbed his thick arms and clung to them like seaweed. He lifted them both without effort and threw them across the deck, then stormed across the ship to his own gun. Fidelia rushed to help Bloody Al to her feet, but Nikyu caught her, his arm wrapped around her neck, and her blood froze as he placed his revolver to her temple. Now, now, little Bebeus, he said in a cooing, mocking tone, the barrel of his weapon cold against her skin. You stay here with me. Let her go, Merrick stopped coughing long enough to say. Bloody Eld picked up her gun and aimed it at Nikyu, massaging her jaw with her other hand. Cheap shot Charlie, too, aimed his pistol at Nikyu. Toss your guns down, Nikyu said, his dark eyes flashing, or I blow her head off. Fidelia stopped breathing. I order you to release her, Merrick set his sapphire eye burning on the other pirate captain. Now. You're in no state to be giving orders, Nikyu twisted the gun deeper into Fidelia's skull, deep enough to leave a mark. She swallowed a yelp. Tell your crew to drop their weapons. With a wave from their captain, Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody Hell surrendered their weapons once again. Merrick was lashed to the mast, the fat rope stacking around his middle like a crocodile's armored belly. Cheap Shot Charlie and Bloody Hell both struggled, but eventually their wrists and ankles were bound, and both of them were secured to a barrel on the main deck. What about the Bebe Luce? A bristly man in a purple headscarf pointed at Fidelia with his pair of guns. Her stomach clenched. With the jewel's crew secured, the other pirates now stalked around Fidelia like wolves, pivoting their revolvers so they were all aimed right at her sweat-slicked forehead. The woman with the daggers homed her glare in on Fidelia especially, her eyes cold mineral green flames, the fat of her pupils reflecting the twilight like a wild animal's. Nick, you too, circled her, assessing. You're puny for a pirate. I'm not a pirate, she said. I live in Arborley. Merrick kidnapped me for... Fidelia stopped. If they learned that Merrick was using her to retrieve his sunken treasure, they might not let her go. She stared at the six revolvers still aimed in her direction. Her mind scrambled to come up with a lie. Six bottomless holes, six black tunnels. For a ransom, Merrick said from the shadows. Fidelia watched Nikki's face and hoped to the sea stars that he believed Merrick. 
The stowaway pirates exchanged a few words in a foreign tongue, and grudgingly, it seemed. They holstered their weapons. When Nikki looked back at Fidelia, he flashed a large white smile. Please, Prelipe, he said, and gestured to the freshly caught fish hanging from his belt. We would like you to share our vittles. Fidelia nearly drooled. She was still so hungry. All she had to eat the entire day was candy from Bon Bon Voyage Sweet Shop, but her gut also told her to keep her distance. She had no idea who these new pirates were, only that they were bold enough to sneak onto the jewel and challenge the notorious Merrick the Monstrous. Why? she asked slowly, cautiously. Nikki spread his arms wide. Any enemy of Merrick's is a friend of the Rasculat. He dropped his arms and scrutinized her with slivered eyelids. Unless you are not an enemy of Merrick's, in which case... Ida Whale always said, Always approach new critters with a tiptoe, in case what you thought were paws turn out to be claws. In the end, Fidelia's hunger persuaded her to take their fish, although she decided she would wait until they ate theirs before she took a bite herself, just in case they tried to get rid of her by poisoning her dinner. The pirates scattered themselves around the cook pot, starting a fire in the sand. Fidelia took a seat on the far end of the bench, sneaking a glimpse at Merrick. He seemed a million miles away, staring at the embers with his signature glower. As two of the pirates cleaned the fish and skewered the meat onto kebabs, they spoke to each other in their native language, their tongues rolling and flicking out sentences. That is my brother Hansi. Nikki suddenly leaned toward Fidelia and pointed to the fellow in the purple headscarf. My brother Luca, the strong man with the beetle black eyes and Drinka, our sister. Drinka jetted her chin out in Fidelia's direction, more a threat than a greeting. Fidelia nodded politely, her nerves still prickling. A sea breeze ruffled the sails, highlighting the silence. Shall I teach you some manners, Bebe Luce? Luca touched a finger to his gun. We gave you our names. Aren't you going to give us yours in return? Please, Nikki put his hand on Luca's back. Let us not be rude, he turned to Fidelia. Forgive us. Your name is yours to keep. When Nikki passed Fidelia her share of the food, she muttered a thank you and ate it slowly, her head down. The Rasculat makes birth in Mulvania. Merrick broke through the silence. You're a long way from home. Nikki glowered at him. I'd have sailed much farther to avenge Yonko. Didn't think there were any of you left. Merrick continued from the mast. Rumor had it that the Navy caught up to the Rasculat and sold her off to Beanies. We are all that remains, Nikki said, sadness coating his voice. Our beloved Rasculat was sunken on the Mulvanian shelf not three months ago. Bridgewater surprised us at the Gulf with 60 galleons. Luca broke his kebab stick in half and threw it at the fire. He slaughtered us. No mercy. The Navy's supposed to run on due process, Drinka said, her cheeks blooming red. Not extermination orders. Bridgewater is his own process, Merrick said. His cannons took the ship right down, as if it was made of straw, Nikki said. He'd have sunk us, too, if we hadn't made it to the coast alive. How quickly things had shifted, Fidelia pondered, as she chewed the most delicious-tasting cod of her life. Moments ago, it was Merrick the Monstrous who had held her imprisoned. Now he was the captive on his own ship. Such was the life of pirates, she guessed. Kings of the food chain one minute, their necks between the teeth of a bigger, stronger beast the next. And apparently for both the pirate crews, this Bridgewater was the beast above them in the chain. Fidelia gratefully finished her kebab. Only then did she notice that Merrick was watching her from across the flames. She held back a shiver. The moon, a weak-colored sickle, rose higher above the water. Night cloaked the ship in darkness. The fire in the sand pit stripped the two groups of pirates in golden light and shadows as the Rasculite captain and crew licked the salt from their fingernails, smacking their lips for the last morsels of flavor before tossing their skewers into the flames. So, Nick, you said to Fidelia, you are captive here. Shanghai? He twirled his beard between his grimy fingers. You want to barter for rescue? 
Fidelia focused on the toes of her boots, the dull light of the moon flashing off the rubber. No, I... She was cut off by an eruption of coughs. Merrick braced himself against the mast, coughing so violently, red spittle flew from his lips, painting the deck. Fidelia's own chest tightened at the sight. The cough of red daisies, Nikki had called it earlier, and Merrick hadn't wasted a second before he denied it. What are the red daisies, she asked, and immediately felt the air on the deck thicken, dense as soup. Nikki took a pipe from his pocket and filled it with crop weed. From the stories, Praley Bay, stories of a turquoise sea that gleams against the sky like liquid gemstones, stories of an underwater cave with enough air to breathe for a day and a night, deep beneath the waves, drawing a dramatic breath. He finished. Stories of treasure. He puffed his pipe, emitting a chalky smoke ring. Merrick tilted his head back against the mast, mismatched eyes to the stars. Fidelia, on the other hand, felt her pulse suddenly spike. Treasure. Chapter 12. There isn't a sailor alive who doesn't wonder if these stories are true. Nicky held his pipe aloft, silhouetting it in the firelight. But few are brave enough to seek it, and those who are have no idea where to find it. He reached into Bloody Elle's knapsack and found a stack of Krakamala bars, which he passed around for Fidelia and the Rasculet sailors to unwrap and nibble. The man who owns this treasure is the most feared pirate to ever sail the Nine Seas, Nicky continued. His name alone is the stuff of legend. Fidelia stole a glance across the fire but Merrick was now concentrating very hard on the dark sea. Now, there has never been a treasure of this size, Prelipe, Nikyu said. Mountains of gold, the stories say. Stockpiles of jewels. Riches that would make the queen sick with jealousy. He puffed on his pipe. But even if the stories were true, few sea dogs would dive down into that cave, even if the stars guided them right to it. Why not? Fidelia nudged her crackamello nearer to the flames in the sand pit until it got nice and gooey. Nikki exhaled smoke through pursed lips. The red daisies, he said. Hansi crossed himself. An odd breed they are, Nikki said. They grow on the walls of the cave, clinging like ivy. Fidelia shook her head. Daisies need sunlight to grow. These daisies do not, Nikki said with such certainty. But... If the red daisies were real, she would have heard of them. She was the daughter of a gilded iguana-winning marine botanist. She would have known the red daisies' scientific name, their bud count, their native habitat. They would have been sketched in her father's observation book. It's only a story, Prelipe, Nikki continued. Anything is possible in a story. Now, the red daisies are beautiful flowers, they say, beautiful and deadly. But it is not the touch of the petals that kills you, no. He took a drag from his pipe. They have a lethal pollen. One inhale, and it is the beginning of the end for you. Everyone seemed to stop breathing at the same time. Fidelia's eyes danced over to Merrick. How does it happen? she asked. Another one of her insistent questions, perhaps, but she had to know. In the stories, I mean. Nikki grimaced, as if even speaking of the delicate subject caused him pain. It is not a pleasant death, Prelipe. The pollen breathes in your very lungs. You stagger for oxygen. A horrible, persistent buzz infects your body until you can barely take ten steps without collapsing in coughs. Beyond the flames, Cheap Shot Charlie squirmed under his ropes. Next is the purpling of the joints. The capillaries slowly burst and inject their liquid into the muscles. Painful, so very painful to experience. Your skin becomes mottled with purple flecks. Fidelia tried to remember how Merrick's arms had looked earlier that day, when he'd removed his pea coat. Were there noticeable lines on his skin, bulging veins? But she couldn't think of anything but that dead, red eye of his. Finally, Nikki said his voice barely audible above the rustling of the jewel's tattered red flag. Your lungs deflate like burst balloons. You die, gasping for air, 
reaching for your last breath, but you never find it. Merrick suddenly burst into coughs, blasting noise up into the stars. Fidelia's ears rang from the shift, the near silence to the harrowing noise of Merrick's lungs, straining for air. She knew the story was real. Of course it was. And Merrick was the dangerous, legendary pirate who owned the underwater cave full of riches. Merrick the Monstrous, Nicky had said to himself. The pirate's name alone was legendary. But the red daisies couldn't be real. Arthur Quayle wouldn't have been able to keep such a morbid specimen out of his discourses. He would have been the only person to ever hunt for the legendary cave, not for its treasures of gold and gemstones, but for its bounty of peculiar marine botany. Fidelia's breath snagged in her throat as she thought of her brilliant, good-hearted father. But if the red daisies were just a fiction, just a story, what about Merrick's cough? Despite what he said, despite how he growled when he said it, this is no simple chest cold eating away at him from the inside. Nikki put his pipe out, smacked it against the bench to empty it of cropweed residue, and walked to the mainmast, where Merrick coughed, still bound. I've dreamed of this very moment for two years, Nikki said. He reached forward and grabbed Merrick's throat with both hands. You sent Yonko down into your cave. You sent him to his death, the Rasculite captain said through bared teeth. Cheapshot Charlie and Bloody L thrashed in their bindings like fish in a net, but to no avail, they had to watch their captain gasp for breath, his face reddening, Nicky's hand tightening around his neck. I held Yonko every night as his lungs slowly choked him, Nicky went on. Everyone could hear him, every night, his cough echoing through the whole ship, like hearing a ghost before the man had died. Merrick still coughed, Nicky holding his head in place against the mast. Every night he asked me, begged me, to put him out of his misery, Nicky said. And one night, he coughed so long and so hard, I nearly went mad from the sound of it. And this time, when he asked, I obeyed. Nicky's voice softened. Can you imagine putting a bullet into your own cousin just to ease his noise? Fidelia held her own breath, her pulse hammering. Behind her, the pirates of the Rasculat stood and readied their guns. Then do it, Merrick spluttered, his lips coated in red spittle. Fidelia closed her eyes, too terrified to watch. But Nicky released Merrick's throat and rubbed his slick hands on his tunic. He smoothed his thicket of curls back into a tighter ponytail. The reign of Merrick the Monsters comes to a fiery close at last, Nicky announced to the jewel looking right at its captain as he spoke. A bead of sweat dribbled down the rasculant captain's forehead. But just because you are going to rot away into obscurity doesn't mean your treasure has to. Nicky squatted down to meet Merrick's eye level. You will go back into your cave and you will bring up every piece of your treasure, he said. Every jewel, every gemstone. Do this and I will kill you before the pollen does. Fidelia shivered what Nikki was offering. It was an act of mercy, really. But Merrick lifted his head, utter blankness on his face, not a whiff of gratitude or desire for the potential charitable act. How generous of you to offer, he said, but I intend to end on my own terms. Rasculats, Nico stood and clapped his hands. It is nearly measle. We have a long way to sail tomorrow, first to Glassport for supplies, then to the tropics pointed at Hansi. Take first watch, and then, pointing at Fidelia, he said, and you. He gestured to the hammock beneath the shrouds. You stay right there. If you move from that spot, I'll tie you to the hull and scrub the ocean floor with you. She should feel some relief, she realized. Merrick was finally tied up, so she was free from his captivity. Free from the crux of the water eater, all of that. But what would the Mulvanian pirates do with her once they'd gotten Merrick's treasure? Would they sail her back to Arwerly? Would they simply let her go? Hansi extinguished the flames in the pit with a kick of sand and stood next to the mast like a naval officer, chest out, hands on his guns, nose alert and in the air. He glared at Fidelia, who quickly flopped into the hammock and pulled her legs up. The ship looked eerie in the cold moonlight. 
without the amber glow of the fire. The shredded sails, silver as cobwebs, the shadows from the masts stretching long and black like tentacle across the deck. Fidelia tried to bundle herself with the pathetically thin blanket that stank of mildew, but her thoughts spiraled, red daisies creeping up a dark cavern, Merrick gasping for breath, his single blue eye wide and bulging, her parents' faces pressed against the egg's porthole window as the submarine circled in, in the undertow like a whirlpool in a bathtub drain. The smoke from the dead fire wound its last curlicues up between the lines, then vanished against the pitch black of night. Across the deck, the Mulvanian pirates were motionless. They'd foregone hammocks or cots, and instead strewn themselves across the floorboards like a pile of slumbering sea lions. Fidelia crossed from side to side, but exhausted as she was, she couldn't get comfortable. A ship used to be calming to her, a rocking cradle to lull her to sleep. Now, her insides shifted with the jewel, she tried to keep everything level. After counting imaginary dolphins leaping out of the water in majestic arcs, she gave up and left the hammock. Hey, Hansi warned, raising his gun for leverage. Go back to bed. She scanned the deck for an excuse to walk near Merrick and spotted the blackjack of water next to the mast. I just need a drink, Fidelia said. I don't care if your throat is the Nesbian desert, Hansi said. You stay in your hammock. Fidelia thought, You know, if your captain decides to take me back to Arborley for ransom, she said, borrowing Merrick's earlier fabrication, my parents will want to know how I was treated. It made her stomach a bit uneasy, using her parents for this lie, but she kept going. They won't be in much of a mood to negotiate if they find out you deprived me of basic necessities. So are you sure your captain wouldn't want you to let me wet my whistle? Maybe you should wake him. A mild threat, but it worked. Hansi's upper lip twitched in annoyance, but he motioned for the black jack, muttering something in Mulvanian as she crossed the deck. Bad dream, Merrick said while Fidelia sipped from the black jack. Fidelia didn't hesitate. Is it true? Merrick stared out at the sea. Parts of it. What parts? She asked. The treasure? The cave? She didn't ask about Nikki's cousin, whether Merrick had truly sent him to his death. She didn't need to. Buzzing, buzzing with the questions, he hissed. You're worse than a damn mosquito. One more question. The red daisies? Instead of answering, he coughed and that was enough for Fidelia. Then you're dying, she whispered, as if it were a secret. But they all knew it, didn't they? Cheap shot Charlie and Bloody L did, with their sideways glances and their tight, strained sighs. They had entire conversations with their eyes every time their captain coughed. Nick, you knew it. He pegged the very cause of Merrick's condition the second he heard it. We're all dying, Merrick said. Not as fast as you are. A chill inched down her spine. That treasure. She found it difficult to breathe. And this, is this what it felt like when the red daisies took their horrible effect on a pair of lungs, drowning in air? You tried to get the treasure out yourself, she hypothesized. Didn't you? He finally used the bright blue eye to look at her, to pierce her. Go away. I don't understand, she went on. You, of all people, you knew how dangerous that cave was. Why would you go in that cave without a diving helmet or a mask? Anger flamed in her chest. How could Merrick treat life this way? Like an angelfish, beauty of the sea, swimming right into a tiger shark's mouth, willingly dying, useless and alone. Enough, he said. You're dying for gold? She couldn't wrap her mind around it. For jewels? I said, enough. He spoke so sharply. Hansi finally noticed. You, Bebelus, the Mulvanian barked at Fidelia. Get away from him. Back to your spot, or I wake Nikki. Fidelia obeyed. Back in the hammock, Fidelia lay flat on her back, peeking at the stars. We're all dying. Merrick's words flitted through her mind like damselflies above a pond. What would it be like? To know your own countdown had started. To know, every day, that the end was coming soon enough to measure.
She thought of her parents in their final moments. At what point had they known that it was their time? She pressed her face into the smelly blanket. She would give anything, all the treasure in Merrick's cave, and then some, if she could redo that last day. She would have done everything different. She would have docked the platypus before the undertow hit. She would have chained her parents to the boardwalk if she'd known the field study would end with body bags. If she'd known it was their last day, she flipped over onto her stomach. These were Merrick's final days. And what was he doing with them? Chasing after a treasure. No, now he was bound to his own mast, and his great treasure, source of all the legends, would go to someone else. Irony was a cruel mistress. Merrick the Monstrous, finally undone by his own cave of wonders, Nikki had said. Her repulsion for Merrick bubbled up like seasickness. Tired as she was, it was a long time until she fell asleep. Two years earlier, Mulvania's market was exceptionally busy that day. Merrick stepped off the dock and into the wet market, strolling through five different conversations conducted in five different languages. People haggled for their own versions of the best prices, shouts of excitement and anger and frustration and delight and a thousand other emotions all bending at once through the bodega. The spectrum of commerce. It was loud enough to drown the thoughts in a man's own mind, but Merrick was quiet as he wove through the stalls. The sun was a fiery golden ball hanging low in the sky like a pendant. Cheap shot Charlie and Bloody L flanked their captain as he moved through the bazaar Twin pillars with sharp eyes, scanning the crowd for a flash of silver buttons or the royal blue of navy uniforms. The paisley maroon headscarf of a Mulvanian coast guardsman? Not a threat. But any sighting of a thatched hay mustache or a head reminiscent of a beat? Make for the ship at once. Tacked to the bricks of a hash house was a poster, a perfect charcoal sketch of Merrick smirking at the viewer as if he knew something they didn't. Merrick the Monstrous, the poster read, wanted for robbery, burglary, arson, murder, jailbreaking, and piracy. Extremely dangerous. 10,000 blue notes for capture, dead or alive. 10,000 blue notes, Bloody Owl whistled. Imagine what we could buy with that kind of bread. Do you two want to turn me in, split the cash? Merrick said. An obvious joke. 10,000 blue notes, as impressive a sum as it was, would be mere pocket change to them. They walked away, leaving the poster where it was. He wandered past baskets of dried shark fins, wooden crates filled with live crabs, florist boots with fresh orchid branches, spice merchants with displays of exotic cinnamon sticks, cardamom, cloves. At every stall, Merrick would do the same thing. Stop, scan, then leave, scowling. This place will be swarming with officers by sundown, Cheap Shot Charlie reminded his captain. We're not leaving until I find something, Merrick said. The Admiral knows you're here. The Admiral can choke on a barnacle. But Merrick did pick up his pace. If he didn't find something here, today, at this wet market, he'd be returning empty-handed. He wouldn't do that again. Not this time. He'd brought her things before, Mother of pearl earrings, emerald necklaces, a belt made of hand-woven alpaca. Each time he'd presented something to her, and she'd just stare at him with those soft eyes, gray as doves, as flint, as the sky after an ocean storm. She didn't even have to say anything. Those eyes said it all. Thank you, but I'm not interested in these things you've stolen. Thank you, but I don't want trinkets. Not something you picked up in a beanie ship. Not something you wrenched from a dying duke's hands. No, she didn't want any of his spoils. But still, for years he had searched for the perfect thing to give her, something to remind her that their love was, to him, as tangible as the gold he plundered, something for her to hold when she couldn't hold him. Something that told her that he saw into the very heart of her, just as she saw him. For years, he had searched and come up empty-handed, and oh, how her pirate hated to search for treasure and come up empty-handed. He stopped at a jeweler's booth. The owner watched Merrick with suspicious eyes, smoking a glass shisha with long, lazy drags. What about this, Captain? Cheap Shot Charlie held up a milky-white comb inlaid with abalone shell. No, 
Merrick said as soon as he looked. She doesn't wear things in her hair. Well, coppers, I don't know the first thing about her. Bloody L skimmed the booth and found a diamond-encrusted tiara, shiny enough to put the sun out of work. This? Merrick scoffed. You just picked up the flashiest thing he has. Don't mind her. Cheap shot Charlie drawled. She doesn't know the first thing about picking out jewelry. Bloody L glared at him, but didn't argue. The merchandise is for buying, not looking, the jeweler said. How can we buy if we do not look at it? Merrick asked calmly, examining a ring. If you don't buy it, the jeweler said, then we're closed. Closed? Merrick repeated. In the middle of the afternoon? Closed to you, the jeweler snapped. Now, go. Other customers want to buy. Merrick pulled a wad of blue notes from his breast pocket of his embroidered overcoat. Here, he said, peeling off a note and tossing it at the jeweler. That should buy us the freedom to browse without you whining. The jeweler hesitated and then took the money. Ten minutes, he said, greedily fondling the bill while Merrick ran his eyes over every piece in the booth. Merrick, he could hear her voice in his head now. A small voice, but powerful, like the northern wind. I don't want your spoils. A set of opal cufflinks. I don't want your stolen gold or rubies or diamonds. Peacock-shaped locket with garnet for the bird's glistening eyes. I only want you. There, he spotted it, tucked in the back corner of the booth like the jeweler was ashamed of it. A pewter brooch with a frilled edge, no gloss or shine to it. Just metal. A fine brooch, the jeweler immediately boasted, worn by the Duchess of Mulvania for her wedding. Save it, Bloody L snapped. Captain, are you sure? It's so gray. Gray, like a pair of eyes, the color of storms. How much? Mary gasped. Twenty thousand green notes, the jeweler said, testing the waters. Like hell it is, cheap shot Charlie's jaw clenched. I should pull out your beard, hair by hair, for thinking you could swindle us. Fine. A thousand green notes, the jeweler said, and puffed his shisha. And I'll be glad to be rid of it. It cheapens the rest of my wares. Merrick reached for his wad of notes, then stopped. This was money he'd acquired through work, through piracy. Either he'd pilfered this cash directly from cocoa ships, or he'd sold the things he'd stolen. He had quite the stockpile of money on him, and on his ship, and even more hidden away in a secret location. But, I only want you, she'd said. His hand bypassed the money and found the only honest thing he had. A silver pocket watch, the one his father had given him when he was a boy. He held it out without a word. The jeweler lifted it to the sky, as if he expected it to be transparent. He checked its gears, then gave a short nod. The trade was accepted. He gave Merrick a little box, and Merrick carefully cradled the brooch in the layers of crushed velvet. That box is probably worth more than that brooch, the jeweler said, his shisha clacking against his teeth. So don't be surprised when your lady is insulted and throws the whole thing in your face for thinking she has such poor taste. When the smoke in his booth finally cleared, the three strangers were gone. The jeweler reached his arms into the air, stretching his back, rolling his head around his neck socket, and the crowd parted, just for an instant, long enough for the jeweler to see the poster glued to the hash house wall. That face, that crooked smile, the fire dancing behind the eyes. Him, he shouted at the shopkeepers around him. The pirate from the posters, he was here in my booth. What a fool, they shout back. Ten thousand blue notes to kill him, and you let him walk free? The wet market suddenly burst into a frenzy of yells. It was always loud, yes, but with the news that profitable pirates were roaming wild, the clamor was unmatchable. The Mulvanian Coast Guard blew their horns. Booths closed their canvas flaps. Beefy mercenaries with tattooed faces dashed to their schooners, readying their curved scimitars and salivating for their handsome rewards as they paddled out of port. But it was too late. The pirates had already slipped away to their ship, and as the sunset painted the horizon in rosy stripes, Merrick took the helm and guided the jewel into open waters, 
the weight of his pocket watch replaced by the heft of a pewter brooch in a velvet-lined box. Something from him. The ocean, like any jungle, has its monsters, its tigers, and its bears. Of course, the supreme king of these underwater beasts is the shark, and he should be treated with utmost respect. Entering the ocean means trespassing into its kingdom, and he has been a fiercely protective monarch. Exploring the Underwater Fairy Tale with Dr. and Dr. Quail. Chapter 13. Fidelia! Dr. Ida Quail's voice carried through the rainforest like a bird's call. Fidelia was crouching on the pad of a giant water lily, Victoria Amazonica, collecting algae samples with a cotton swab. She paused, a catfish splashing her as it crept up the riverbank. Her mother repeated the cry, Fidelia, come quick! The hairs on the back of Fidelia's neck stood at attention. She jumped onto shore and cruised through the green undergrowth until she reached the treehouse. The treehouse was about 20 feet up, the perfect height for the quails' research hub in the jungle, too high for most carnivorous prowlers, too low for pesky monkeys, or so they thought. Fidelia hurried up the bamboo ladder, her gut nodded in terror. Mom sounded like she was in trouble. Her imagination whizzed with the dreadful possibilities. Had Dr. Quail been cornered by a jaguar? Did she get scraped up by a patch of walking palm trees? Had a foul-tempered anaconda slithered into the treehouse? There were countless other things that could go wrong during a field study. So far, the quails had been lucky. But what if today was the day their luck had finally run out? Ida Quail was in the treehouse, hunched over with her back to the door, limbs still intact, still breathing, as far as Fidelia could tell. She approached her mother cautiously. Mom, what's wrong? Her mother giggled and spun around. She held a baby three-toed sloth, which had its arms wrapped around her neck like a human infant. The sloth was wearing Fidelia's spare glasses, the awful horn-rimmed ones that she only kept around as a backup. She won't take them off, Dr. Quail said. Fidelia tickled the lethargic sloth under the chin. She can keep them. They look better on her anyway. She placed a sunbonnet on the critter's head, and the sloth dreamily leaned its head back, modeling it. Fidelia, Dr. Arthur Quail jogged up the ladder, a sliver of suma root in his hand. Ah, there you are. Let me see that arm. A cloud of mosquitoes hovered around Dr. Quail's chin. His blood-sucking companions were determined to penetrate his wiry goatee, but were ultimately unsuccessful thanks to a newly concocted mosquito repellent made from vine juice and figs. She extended her arm. A bite from a rat snake crossed her wrist. It's not that bad, she said, but Dr. Quail dabbed the milk from the sumarut onto the entry. This will keep it from scarring. He kissed her forehead. Now, I can't find my notes on the stargrass specimens. Have you seen them? The treehouse was a hurricane of crumpled bedsheets, browning apple cores, and manila file folders. You two are slobs. Fidelia used her toe to slide a goliath cockroach off Dr. Quail's clipboard. They're right here. What would we do without you? Ida said. The sloth climbed onto Fidelia's shoulder. When the critter peeked up at Fidelia from under the bonnet, it had one blue eye and one black and red eye. The black and red eyes started bleeding. The sound of gulls clucking woke Fidelia, and the last whispers of her dream fizzled away. It was dark still, the light thin, the stars faint. That strange, uncategorized moment between night and dawn. She pushed herself up to a sitting position and found her glasses. No sign of any black clouds or tempestuous waters. But there, in the distance, she could see the blurred outline of the horizon climbing, of trees, the corners of buildings, the mainland. Glassport, she identified the famous glass dome on the skyline immediately. This is what Aunt Julia wants for me, Fidelia thought, rubbing warmth into her arms. A move to a city like this. A new fire flickered beneath the cook pot. The pirates of the Rasculat stood around the sand pit, thank you stirring a pot filled with Mulvanian coffee. Fidelia knew the scent. It was Ida Quayle's favorite java black as tar, strong enough to stand up a spoon in it, blinking hard before the tears could pool. Fidelia swung her legs to exit the hammock. 
But then she heard Nick use words. All the way back to Arbery for her ransom, he was telling the others. It's not worth the trip. But Dahlia quickly lay back down, pretending to be asleep. Her ears straining to hear the rest of the conversation above the usual din of sailing, chains clanking, the creaking of old wood bending into water, the wind flapping the sails. Then what do we do with her? Hansi said. I'm not babysitting. We'll sell her to the highest bidder, Nick you said. There'll be someone in Glassport that'll want her. Mateo, maybe. Or Lucian and Crow, Drinka suggested. Nick you shrugged, sipping his coffee from a tin mug. Either way, she'll fetch a fine price. Fidelia's heart sickened. Now what? She didn't want this. Didn't want any of this. She didn't want to go with Mateo or Lucian or Crow or any other dangerous-sounding, piratical sort. She didn't want to stay with the Mulvanian pirates, either. She hadn't even wanted to leave Arborley in the first place. A cold fear throbbed in the hollow of her stomach. And a rage. This was Merrick's fault. He was the one who dragged her away from Arborley Island. And now, it seemed, she would have to get herself out of this mess. If she explained to the Mulvanian pirates who she really was... If she promised them some sort of reward money for returning her safely and promptly to Arborley Island, would they believe her? Would Aunt Julia be able to scrape together an amount of cash that would suffice? She planted her feet on the deck boards, hoping she would be able to bargain her way into a safe trip home. But she stopped. Merrick, still leaning back against the mainmast, suddenly rolled forward, the ropes that bound him falling silently away from his body and onto the boards. Fidelia gaped, her eyes flickering to the Mulvanian pirates. None of them noticed as Merrick stealthily dropped on all fours, crawled to Bloody Owl and cheap shot Charlie, and sliced through their ropes with the dagger in his boot. Adrenaline coursed through Fidelia, but she willed her heartbeat to steady itself and considered her choices. She could scream and alert the Mulvanians, strangers who were planning to sell her off. What if they didn't make a deal with her? What if they refused to take her back to Arborley? She could be bounced all over the world, from ship to ship. She might never get back to Aunt Julia. Or she could stay silent and trust that Merrick would stay true to his word to return her after she helped him to retrieve his treasure. The monster she already knew, or the monster she didn't? Fidelia chewed her bottom lip as Merrick, Cheap Shot Charlie, and Bloody L stole across the deck, one light step at a time. Merrick's throat bobbed up and down. A cough tickled, but he stayed silent as the waters. Could she trust him to return her home when this was all over? One look at his blue eye, and she knew she had to believe him. Scrub the pond scum off the ship, Nikki ordered, giving the chipped, rough, rough railing a severe look and find something to patch her up. Oakum, if you have it. We'll fully refurbish her when we have the bread for it. Bloody L crept, ever so quietly, behind a row of barrels, readying a broken board to use as a club. Meanwhile, Cheapshot Charlie shook the numbness from his arms and climbed up the main mast like a spider. He began untying the knots, holding the tangled ropes to the mast. Luca dropped his empty coffee tin and stepped away from the sand pit, and Merrick struck. He seized Luca, pressing his blade into the pirate's neck. The other Mulvanians jumped, yanking out their guns. Before they could fire, Cheap Shot Charlie loosened the ropes, trapping the Mulvanian pirates in a heap on the deck, where they bobbed like idiot carp. Monstrous, Nick you cried. This isn't over. I'll have you... Bloody L charged forward, battling the revolvers from the Mulvanian pirates with her board. Cheap Shot Charlie climbed down from the rigging and joined Bloody L, seizing weapons and restraining the jeweled invaders. But in the tussle, Nikki kept a hold of his gun, and, from his position lying on the deck boards, aimed it through the ropes, not at Merrick, but at Fidelia, who stared back at the revolver. The dark tunnel of the barrel was a tiny black circle across the deck. A shark sign moments before... It rolled back into its socket. Her heart stopped. Her feet froze, everything slowing as Nikki's finger inched back on the trigger. Aunt Julia's face surfaced in her mind, and Fidelia clenched her eyes shut. Merrick stepped in front of Nikki's gun just as it was discharged. As Merrick staggered back, grasping his left shoulder, 
he dropped his grip on Luca. Bloody L seized Nikki's gun from his hand and spun it around to face Luca, who put both hands in the air. Merrick knelt on the boards and angled his dagger against Nikki's neck. Please, Nikki choked, his oily black hair caked in dust. Kill me quickly. I thought anyone from the Rasculat would have more sense than to chase after legends, Merrick said, not a shred of pain in his voice. Especially after losing one of your own to the daisies. Nikki looked up at Merrick, his eyes wide in fear. How could I live with myself, he whispered, to be so close to Merrick the Monstrous and not try to win his gold. Merrick let the tip of his blade drag along Nikki's skin. How does it feel now to stare at your death? Nikki said nothing. Fidelia thought she could feel every billow in the sails, every insignificant wave beneath the jewel. Even the morning breeze held itself back, waiting. Are you thinking about gold now? Merrick growled. Riches? A stockpile of gems? Nikki shook his head. My, my home. Merrick named it for him. Mulvania. Yes. Nikki tilted his head back onto the boards and closed his eyes. A golden sun over farmlands. Rolling green hills and mountains and snow. Frescoes hanging in the, vil in the village cathedral. Older than my grandmother. The house I grew up in. Only a shack, but my home. Goosebumps prickled on Fidelia's arms. Home. Oh, Yanko. Nico whispered this, a sad smile on his face. I failed you, my cousin. You'll see him soon enough. You can beg for forgiveness then. Merrick tensed, his mouth a long, bold, killing line as he pressed his dagger into Nikki's throat. Fidelia's insides constricted. No! She ran to Merrick's side and held on to his elbow. He tried to shake her off, but she clutched tighter than a barnacle. You can't kill him. I won't let you. Stay out of this, Quail. Merrick motioned to Sheepshot Charlie, who grabbed Fidelia around her middle and hauled her back. I won't help you, she spat. I'll throw my water eater right overboard. Then you'll have to figure out some other way to get your precious treasure. She felt electric, blazing with righteous energy, bargaining energy. Or, she fired on, You'll have to send me down into the cave alone, without anyone to protect me. Will you really send me down to my death? I'll make you do it. She paused, catching her breath. Would he truly make her suffer the way he was? Was he really that monstrous? He looked at her, unblinking, his blue eye burning. With a snarl, he stabbed his dagger into the deck and grabbed Nikki by the collar of his tunic. He dragged the Mulvanian pirate to the railing hoisted him up, and held him over the side of the ship. It was terrifying, Merrick's burst of strength, his peacoat flapping open, his shirt beneath unbuttoned, revealing a chest sunken enough to hold water. But still, he lifted this bear of a man and dangled him above the water as if he were an empty candy wrapper. Nikio did not fight back. He didn't kick his legs or throw punches. He simply locked eyes with Merrick and bowed his head. I will watch for you in the stars, he said. Not a threat, but a simple statement. A final blessing of sorts. A premature eulogy. Stop. Fidelia yanked free of Cheap Shot Charlie's hold and rushed over to Merrick. Too late. Merrick threw the captain of the Rasculat overboard, and from the deck of the jewel, Fidelia could see the ring of white where Nikki splashed in the water, and then disappeared. Cheapshot Charlie turned toward the rest of the Mulvanian pirates. He removed the tangled ropes, but before he could lay hands on them, the pirates rushed the rail and one by one jumped over the side and into the blue. Fidelia scanned the water, but the jewel moved so quickly she couldn't see whether the pirates were still bobbing at the surface or if they had already sunk to the bottom like stones. Merrick nonchalantly checked the time on his pocket watch. The jewels aching to stretch her legs, mates. Let's let her run. Churning white hot with fury, Fidelia bubbled over. You, you killed them. I did not kill them, Mary corrected. Notice how there's no Mulvanian blood on my deck? No, Fidelia seethed. 
You didn't slit their throats, but they're as good as dead. Glassport is within range. Merrick pointed back at the mainland. They managed to survive their shipwreck in Mulvania. They're obviously strong swimmers. But their ship didn't go down during the undertow. Even the strongest swimmers don't stand a chance. The sea was too choppy today. The Mulvanians were probably already on the ocean floor. Fidelia slumped at the railing, watching the morning sun hit the waves. You murdered them. Quite the moralizing coming from a scientist, Merrick said. Tell me again about your starfish dissections, about how you bleed fish to make shark chum. And tell me again what happened with the silver sea cub. Fidelia stood straight up. She knew exactly what Merrick was referencing, exploring an underwater fairyland, her parents' book. A thousand counter-arguments darted through her head at once. The starfish limbs they had dissected to better understand their suction capabilities in tropical waters. The blood they harvested for chum was from tuna, which they used only because the populations were oversaturated near the island. And the silver sea cub, well, that cub, she started, was dying, Merrick said, and you and your parents did nothing to interfere. She opened her mouth to protest, but nothing came out. What could she even say? If she reached into her bag for her observation book, she could find the exact entry that described that day, with far more detail than the chapter from her parents' book. February 11th. Today was a sad day. Yesterday we found a colony of silver seals migrating east for what Mom calls the family reunion. Every clan of silver seals from all over the region meet. Mating happens. Babies are taught to hunt for fish under the ice. They stay until spring and then hightail it back to the glacier fronts to eat the new green shoots and fatten up for the next family reunion. One seal cub wouldn't leave his mother's side. She barked at him. He cuddled closer. She nipped at him. He tried to nurse. When we finally got a good look at him, we saw why. The cub was blind, milky white eyes, a thick film over the pupils. No wonder he acted like the umbilical cord was still attached, but the pod started to move. The mother pushed the seal away from the group, off to his own patch of arctic gnome grass. He munched a few blades and then cried out for her, but she ignored him, flopping along on her belly with the rest of the clan. She's abandoning him, I cried, but Dad shushed me. When the pod was out of range, the cub stopped his wailing. Maybe he ran out of strength, I don't know. Or maybe he sensed what had happened. He sniffed around the gnome grass for a few minutes and then shuffled off into the wilderness. We can't just let him go, I told mom and dad. He'll die out there. I grabbed a rope and said, I'll go after him and no, Fidelia, mom said quietly, like the funeral for the little cub had already started. This morning, when we were near the penguin burrows, we found the cub's body, frozen solid in the snow, his white eyes staring up at the sky. I know all about the ethics of observation. I know about the principle of study, that we can't watch nature without affecting it somehow. But I see that silver cub every time I close my eyes, and probably will for a long, long time. Sometimes it's hard to be a quail. Fidelia gritted her teeth, willing herself to stay where she was and not charge at Merrick with fists swinging. She hated him for bringing up that day. That was a terrible day. It's not the same thing, she managed to say, shaking. It's not the same thing at all. The quail's work wasn't about death. It was about life. And yes, sometimes that included death. And was Merrick forgetting how the chapter about the silver seals ended in exploring an underwater fairy tale? The last words Idaquel wrote in the chapter were, The circle of life, the food chain, the give and take of nature. However it is phrased, life always ends in death. Death, yes, that terrifying ending that every living thing is plummeting to. Yes, but how wonderful life is while it endures. Merrick's smirk was unbearable. You're alive for today, aren't you? And I believe you have a set of gills to finish assuming you are as good as your word. Fidelia felt his mismatched eyes on her as she left the railing, sat on the bench next to her water eater, and listlessly opened her observation book. 
How on earth was she supposed to concentrate on work right now? Bloody L picked up the ropes that had bound Merrick. Charlie, she murmured, come here. She showed him the length of the rope. Fidalia leaned forward to eavesdrop. He didn't cut it, Bloody L whispered. Then how, Cheapshot Charlie said, his eyebrows furrowed. Both of them looked across the ship at Merrick, his skinny forearms poking out of the sleeves of his peacoat as he checked the tackle. His wrists, Bloody L said. She held her hand to her mouth. Look at them. Fidelia marveled at them. Merrick's wrists had absolutely wasted away since last night, the bones jutting from the pale skin like knobs on a pine trunk. Was he disintegrating so quickly? Charlie, Bloody L's voice was small and scared. Cheap shot Charlie studied her face, then approached Merrick slowly, as if approaching a wild animal. Captain, Cheap shot Charlie said. Merrick said nothing. Cheap shot Charlie nervously scratched the back of his bald head. That Nick you. He said he put his cousin out of his misery. Cheap shot Charlie hesitated, still watching the captain with something akin to compassion, softening his features. Merrick stared at Cheap shot Charlie. His face is still as chiseled marble. You have no idea what misery is. Don't speak to me about it ever again. The captain's black and red eye throbbed in its socket. Then Merrick struck. He stood tall and backhanded his boatswain with his gaunt hand, a wallop that must have stung horribly since Merrick's knuckle bones poked out like the tines of a rake. Cheapshot Charlie staggered back, hand on his cheek. Now, set our course south, Merrick said calmly. Cheapshot Charlie straightened. Aye, Captain. He headed to the helm, refusing to look up at Bloody L as he passed her. Merrick swatted Fidelia watching, and so she quickly buried her head into the observation book and pretended to work. Merrick the monstrous, not a shred of mercy in his bones, not even for himself. And that is where we're going to stop today. I hope you guys are enjoying this book. Um, I will see you guys in a few days with another installment. Bye!